Well, hey, everybody, how you doing? Uh, this is Pastor Corey here. It is Wednesday afternoon, and uh, I'm recording this for our Wednesday evening youth group. It is an awesome, awesome lesson tonight, guys. As we start off Unit 5, Lesson 1, we're going to be talking about dignity. And there is so much that can be said on that, on this point. There are some awesome, awesome things this lesson brings up. I really hope it's a blessing and a challenge to you. Look forward, hoping to see uh, some of you at least this upcoming Sunday as we take our first steps at getting back to a normal schedule. Uh, if you have not yet watched Pastor's message for this evening, please do that once this one is done. He gives some information, some instructions on how we're going to handle coming back to church this Sunday at 11 a.m. for our first service back since the whole coronavirus um, concerns have broken out. So I pray everyone is staying well, staying healthy. Hope to be able to see you this weekend. Let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer now so we can jump right in and start learning about what this dignity issue is all about. So join me in a word of prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Lord, thank you for this lesson that has been uh, just placed into a schedule at such a perfect time as some of the other things we're doing with the discussion group here, talking about the image of God and understanding what it means to be made in your image. I just pray you would give us all a deep and total understanding of how awesome it is to be made in your image, Lord, that you have made all of us in your image. And that is something that I think far too often and for too many people we fail to really see. We fail to understand the gravity of that. God, I just pray you would help us to see the dignity that you have placed in the lives of everyone. Help us to see people through your eyes and not through the eyes of the world or of, of, of ourselves. Lord, I just pray for everyone who is still struggling right now, whether it be with sickness or financial issues, uh, just getting stir crazy, being, being locked inside a little too long. Father, just pre please give us all peace and confidence and assurance you are with us in this time. You are caring for us and giving us a foundation to stand on. Lord, if people are sick or have family members that are sick, I pray for healing in their lives. Thank you for the updates on Rosa that we have received, that she is beginning to do better with her pain, but she still has a long way to go with this uh, strain of antibiotics that she's taking right now. Lord, we just pray that would be completely successful and she would be able to get back to a normal life and a normal daily routine. Father, we just thank you for all the many, many ways you bless us each and every day. Lord, we cannot wait to be brought back together to fellowship, to worship together, to praise you together, and just to learn from your word together. Father, thank you for everything, and in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, so tonight, as I said, we're talking about dignity. So first, to start off, did you guys get into the workbook and do the activity, the first day activity for this week? If you have not, do it. It is awesome. It asks you to make a list of the various words that you think of that affirm or call out dignity in an, in an individual, things that communicate that person's dignity. Second, it asks you to make a list of the words that strip people of their dignity. Then, when you have your two lists, the list that affirms dignity and the list that strips dignity, ask yourself, when I'm describing people, how often do I use words from each of these lists? It's a really sobering experience when you sit back and think about it. When I am talking about people, whether it's to that person or to another person about them, how am I describing them? Am I using words that build them up and are edifying to them, or am I using words that tear them down? And that's, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, keeping our tongues and our mouths and the words we choose to describe people under control? How do we use them effectively and in a way that brings glory to God and lets his light shine to people? And how do we avoid using them in a way that might tear someone down, that might uh, cause more harm than good? So as we get in tonight, we're going to start off right away looking at our misconception about dignity. The misconception is that dignity is a person's value or worth earned from or determined by others. Now, if you look up dignity in Webster Merriam Dictionary online, you're going to see a definition that's oddly close to what we're saying is wrong. 
It's, it's the misconception about dignity. Dignity is not a worldly value that is placed on you, right? In John 4, 9, we see Jesus encountering the woman at the well. And the woman says to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? So the woman at the well thought that her worth, her status, was tied up in being a woman or tied up in where she was from. Jesus went out of his way to find her. He went to that spot specifically to reach out to her, to show that she had value to God and that God wanted her to stop drinking from that same old well every time and instead drink of living water. She had value in the eyes of God. In Mark 2.16, the scribes and the Pharisees are a little irritated because Jesus is sitting and eating and talking with these sinners and these publicans, they say. And they ask his disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and with sinners? The Pharisees were judging these people as being worth less than the righteous people that they associated, right? They associated with. They were appalled that Jesus would rather sit with those people instead of the pious crowd. Jesus set them straight by asking what? Who needs a doctor, the sick or the healthy? He declared that he came to save sinners. He came to be a doctor to those that were sick, right? He sets the record straight. So this misconception that dignity is a person's value or worth earned from or determined by others is hogwash, but it's so easy to fall into. We get so caught up into our status in life, where we are at in our careers, where we're at in popularity at school, our status amongst even our own family can be a big issue sometimes, right? And none of those things are important to God. They're all these fake temporary things that we build up as being these great milestones we have to conquer in life, and it's just not true. That's not how God sees things. No, the illumination for today is dignity is the God-given human condition of having value and worth. And that is a powerful statement when you really sit down and think about it. Dignity is the God-given condition of having value and worth. And the verse I'd like to share concerning that tonight is Genesis 1, 26 through 27. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over everything, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. What an awesome, amazing promise the Bible gives us about our origin. We are created in the image of God. In our discussion group that we've been having covering the Bible Project, we did a a segment on the image of God in man. And one of the things the, the gentleman leading the podcast said is if we fully grasped, if we really understood what it is to be made in the image of God, we would nearly feel compelled to fall down and worship people because the image of God is such a powerful thing. Now, we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't make idols out of ourselves or out of someone else. But it's a really interesting picture to think of that if we could understand how amazing it is that we are made after the image of God, he wrote the law on our very hearts, right? We have similarities with God that we uh, would just see our fellow brothers and sisters and the men and women of the world in a totally different light. When we look at them, we're not looking at a person. We're looking at someone who bears the image of God. Do you think that would change your perspective of people a little bit? I think it would for me. Now, our reading this week is two passages. The first is Zechariah 7, and the second is Matthew 23. It was verses 1 through 12 and 23 and 24. And again, we have that illumination on the screen highlighted. That is just such a powerful statement. Dignity, the God-given human condition of having value and worth. Now, in Zechariah 7, the people ask God if they could perform uh, a religious rite of mourning, right? And God turns and asks them, he reads their hearts and asks them, are you doing it for God or for yourself? 
cornered him right there. Likewise, in Matthew 23, Jesus admonishes the Pharisees. He calls them out for tithing while neglecting the weightier things of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness. In both accounts, the people were more interested in performing religious rituals than they were in loving people, right? That, that's, that's the point. It's, it's something we see time and time again in the Bible and time and time again out in the world. People get so caught up in going through the motions. They get so caught up in doing church stuff that they miss the entire spirit of what we're to be about in this world, to go out to make disciples, to spread the gospel, to be the light that God has allowed us to be to the world so that other people can see him through us. We can do that through love and mercy and justice. Matthew 23, 28, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and he says, even so you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you're full of hypocrisy, full of lawlessness. Like we said, it's just so easy to go through the motions. In Zechariah 10, God mentions widows, the fatherless, foreigners, the poor. All of these people are so easy to get neglected and to get cast aside and beat down. We have to remember how God views these people. They have God-given value, regardless of what the world says they have or don't have. They have as much value as you and I. God loves everyone, and he desires that everyone would come to him to be adopted into his kingdom, to become one of his children. So we can't treat people any less regardless on what their background is. He cares about all humanity. Every person, as you can see on your screen here, every person should be treated with dignity and respect no matter their religious background, their sexual orientation, their skin color, their economic status, whatever it is, it does not matter. We are all made in God's image, and we all have God-given value. So the video that's going to be coming up here in just a second is uh, Kelly as she takes her trip to Uganda And she meets with a woman that has a really, really powerful testimony. And she's going to say that there's parts that are a little hard to hear, but I would challenge all of you. uh, It is is a powerful, powerful testimony for sure. And it gives us really, really powerful insight on what happens when we fail to treat someone with dignity and what can happen when God takes over and starts restoring that person. So let's uh, go ahead and turn over to that video now and listen to it. It is an awesome, awesome testimony. Hey friends, I still can't believe that this whole journey has led us to Uganda. From the moment we arrived, so much of it already reminded me of where I grew up in Brazil, which was a really nice surprise. From the deep green forest, the landscape, to the beautiful vibrant flowers I saw everywhere, we headed to Kampala, the capital of Uganda, a city that is home to over two million people, which you can tell from the traffic and just life happening there. And one of the very first people we met in Kampala was Tracy, whose smile, hospitality, energy, spirit, all of it would really embody the spirit of the people of Uganda. Divided in ages, so we have... Tracy works for an organization that has a vision that everybody deserves the opportunity for a healthy life and a healthy family. And they do this through a variety of programs and services. Tracy's own passion for this organization really comes from her own story, which um, I should warn you guys can have certain parts that are a little bit hard, but without any hesitation and with a wide open heart, Tracy sat down with me and shared her story. I was born uh, out of the assist and um, a rape. And my mother was 15 years by then. And um, 
the only solution that came to her was abortion. And um, she, that's what actually my father then suggested, uh, abortion. And the people around her, that's what they suggested. But fortunately, my grandmother was not for it. And then she said, no, I'll, I'll raise her. Uh, you're not the first, and I know my daughter, so it will be well. And so when I was born, uh, my, my grandmother took over me. And um, just three years after that, my mother passed away. So I was raised up by my grandmother. But it wasn't such fun because I was looked at as an outcast. The, even the fact that, you know, I didn't really have a sister, a brother, and now I didn't have a mother, neither did I get to know my father. So it was really very tough for me. In every community, you know, you have where you come from, like in our culture, they'll ask you where, where do you come from, like who are your parents? And I had no answer for this, for all this. So I always felt out of place. And I never wanted to talk about things like that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. even like in kids, you're talking about your mother, you're talking about your parents. I never had such, you know. I could never talk about such things. So it wasn't fun, like for me growing up. And um, at the age of actually 17, I left home, uh, trying to struggle work for myself. and. I tried drinking and, you know, things like where maybe I would find a sense of belonging. Right. But, but it wasn't still enough. I always felt empty. Mm -hmm. at, at around the age of 18, 17, that's when I met um, missionaries. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they told me about the gospel. Mm. And um, that's, that's when, when my life. whole life changed. Really? Yeah. And um, that's, that's when, when I got back my, my, my consciousness, maybe I can't mm. say. I started appreciating myself. Mm. I got to know who I am. I realized actually that I'm actually, I have a father in heaven. Mm -hmm. I am, I'm, I'm not by mistake. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's when, when I started loving myself. Yeah. That's, that's when, when I got that sense of belonging, like, oh, I have a heavenly father. Mm -hmm. I actually have heavenly parents, so I'm You're not. Precious, yeah, I'm precious. I'm, oh, I'm a gem. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm precious. You know, yeah. I'm not here. It's not that I'm here by mistake. No, I'm here for a purpose, for a reason. Mm -hmm. and, and that's when I started looking at what's my purpose here, mm -hmm. you know. And from that time, I looked at life differently. Yeah. I forgave people that I thought had hurt me. I, you know, I get back like life, you know. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was happy and... I started looking at life differently. And um, learning more about the gospel was really fulfilling for me. It, uh, it brought another me, you know, and I, I felt life complete, you know. Part of what I love about Tracy's story are those who saw her dignity, her value, her worth, despite all the other people who pushed her to the sidelines, who ignored her, who made her feel invisible. Her grandmother was different. She saw her dignity despite the circumstances of her birth. The missionaries saw her as someone who God values, not because of her current situation, but because of the full life in Christ that God intends for everyone to know and for everyone to have. And now, Tracy gets to call out the dignity of others through her work. I, I saw so many of kids that have gone through the same, mm. uh, that had my same past, past, past right, and right. background. Okay. They ended up in addiction. My desire and my passion 
was to help these young people and also put families together. Yeah. And uh, you know, give them those principles of life that they can live and also, but in that, you also teach them about the gospel, you know, and teach them about the gospel and the things that they can't follow that and leave the world. If they leave the world and act upon it, really, these things come to pass. They, they, they are blessed right. and their life is totally different because there's something that the gospel gives. It gives that hope. I, I remember when I was a kid, I was around nine, my own auntie told me not to play with her kids because I was a nobody. Wow. And, and, and now she was here looking at me like, wow. And they started asking me actually that, who is your God? Mm. They started looking at me differently and they started appreciating me and they were calling me somebody. And interesting, they were even coming for consultations to me. Wow. And they were sending their own kids, you know, like to come and, and ask like what, how I've done it. Yeah. How do? And the only thing I would just tell them, you know, God, the gospel, God is true, God, God lives. But there is nothing that happens by mistake. Mm -hmm. And I actually got to appreciate that if it hadn't been the way it was, then I wouldn't even be able to reach out to people. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. Maybe be as passionate or understand exactly. or have your heart just go out to yeah. those children. Yeah, and... exactly. Because what I do is I share my story with them and then and I encourage them and I nurture them and I talk to them and give them hope. And, and what they need is just love and compassion. Mm -hmm. It's not even sympathy or, 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 you know, pity. No. Yeah. They need just love. They, they need compassion. They need empathy. Yeah. And that's why I just share with them. Mm -hmm. And when all that happens, you know, I, I, I realize um, who I am because of God's love. You know, love gives that sense of belongs. It gives confidence. It gives protection. That identity, right? Yeah, identity. It gives you that identity, which gives you confidence, which gives you hope and life, you know? Yeah. So if you don't feel loved, you feel empty. I can share my story because I've overcome it. I've yes, overcome it. you've been transformed. Yeah, I've been transformed. It's amazing. It's amazing how it's a victory story. It's a victory. It's a beautiful story. It's amazing. It's a beautiful story. Thank you. Thank you so much. Something that we were reminded of a lot in our time in Uganda is that you cannot give anybody dignity. That is already theirs. It's already in them because they are made in the image of God. It is not yours to give. It is yours to see to recognize, to call out in other people. Justice can start when we recognize the shared dignity that we all have as sons and as daughters of God. More from Uganda next week. Ciao. What a powerful video. That is, what an awesome testimony. I love when she says that when the missionaries saw her for her, they saw her in the value God had given her, not in the situation the world had placed her in. That was the beginning of the change in her. These people saw the image of God in her, saw her dignity, and they called it out. And now she's able to go forth and be this awesome, just evangelist to these children, to these families there. When they come and they ask her, who is your God? Because they can see in her life, something is different about this person. She was once consumed with everything that had gone wrong in her life. The situations had overtaken her. She was getting into alcohol, all these different things. But now look at her, look at what she's doing. And she gets this opportunity to say, my God is alive. He's changed my life to be a witness for him. It's amazing. So guys, closing out tonight with our core verse and core concept, 
Our core verse is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. As free, Peter's talking about as being free men and women saved by Jesus Christ, free from the burden of sin, free from the confines that the world tries to put us in. Not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Guys, behavior and treatment toward people are always an outcome of the way that we see them, right? The way we treat them is a direct correlation to how we view them. Conversely, when we see people the way God sees them, it becomes very hard to dishonor that person. Guys, when you see a lady, if you look at that lady the way God sees her, you're going to treat her very differently than if you look at her the way the world sees her, right? This is so important for us to grasp. And in the same way, when we maintain a proper view of who God is and how awesome him making us in his image is, it becomes very hard to dishonor him, to dishonor ourselves. It's when we lose focus. It's when that image of who he really is gets blurry that we start to slip and justify little things to ourselves and not hold ourselves accountable like we should. It's all about maintaining a proper view of people and of God. In order to treat people right and to have the proper relationship with God, we have to see them correctly. Correctly as in the way God views them. The core concept and our point to close on tonight is Being a witness requires that I see everyone always with dignity and with respect. Guys, it's not asking a lot, but it will make all the difference in the world when you talk to somebody. And now I want to call out one point. It says everyone. Tonight we've talked about seeing people that are weak or vulnerable, or we would perceive as weak and vulnerable is a better way to say that, coming from a background that that is kind of easier for us to look at and say, man, we have to get out. We have to help these people. Look, look at the way they're living. But we're saying that we need to view everyone always with dignity and respect. That includes someone that may not be that nice to you, right? It includes the people that maybe have bullied you or uh, have talked down to you, tried to say nasty things about you, right? We're to treat them with the same respect and dignity as everyone else. That's when it starts to get a little hard to maintain that right image. But even though that person may be struggling with who knows what, they may be seeing something in you that they wish they had and striking out at you for it, it doesn't matter. We're called to see them the way God sees them with value and to demonstrate his love to them. The final verse I'd like to share with you tonight is Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Go back to those lists. If you haven't made them yet, get in your books tonight, tomorrow, and do it. If you have a list of all of these words that strip people of their dignity, let's get them out of your vocabulary right now. Let's let no corrupt communication come forth from our mouth. Let's focus on building people up and giving grace to people through the power of the Holy Spirit. Guys, awesome, awesome lesson. I hope you take it to heart. I hope you think on it. Are you treating people with respect and dignity? Always. Because that's the goal to treat them the way we want God to treat us, the way we want others to be treating us, right? We want to be that example to the world, to see value in people, to call it out, and to show them. Because a lot of people have no idea that they have value, but they do, not because we give it to them or the world says they have it, but because God made them with value. 
because he made them in his image. Let's close there in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this lesson that you've given to us. Thank you for the study on uh, what dignity is, Lord, and how crucial it is that we treat people with respect and with love and with dignity. God, we can never fully grasp how amazing it is to be made in your image until we reach a point that we can see you wholly and completely in our glorified bodies in heaven. But Father, I just pray you would work on our hearts and minds each and every day that you would just keep us in awe of the fact that we represent you to the world as saved men and women. Lord, that you have given us an opportunity to go out and to be a witness to people to tell them the story of Jesus Christ, to tell them our testimony, how you've worked in our lives, how you've changed us, how you have shown us our value that you have bestowed on us from the very moment we were created. Father, I pray that uh, if any of us are struggling to see our own worth, to see our own value, God, I pray that you would make that known in amazing ways to anyone struggling with that. It's so easy in today's world to get caught up and be self-conscious and beat ourselves up, and that's not the way you have intended us as free, saved men and women to live. God, I just thank you for being with us always, for placing people in our lives that can encourage us and can call out the, the value that you have placed in our lives, the gifts that you have given us and the people that can help guide us in using those gifts, Lord, to go out and do work for you to bring glory to your name. Lord, I just pray everyone stays well, stays safe. There are people that need healing, need, need to talk, need reached out to for encouragement. Lord, I pray you just would make those needs known, that you would give us an opportunity to make those connections, to talk with one another, and to build each other up, to give grace to the people we're talking to. Father, we thank you for all the blessings you do give us, and in Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, everybody, you have a great night. Looking forward to hopefully seeing you all this Sunday at 11 a.m. here at the church. If you need anything, as always, give me a call. I am so excited to get back together with you guys and start doing our regular routine on Wednesday nights again. Hopefully, that will be sooner than later. If not, we'll keep on doing what we're doing and enjoy the time that we have to uh, just dig deeper into our relationship with God, our relationship with our families, and uh, trying to figure out what the image of God in my life is. How do I reflect God to the world? All right, guys, have a great night. We'll see you soon.